For more on this, I've been speaking to Dr Vinayak Prasad, who leads the Who Tobacco Free initiative, and also Jason Reed, a programme manager and UK lead for uh, Young Voices. Dr Vinayak Prasad began with an overview of today's report. The World Health Organization uh, comes out with a global report on the tobacco epidemic every two years. The last report came out in 2019, July. And this is the eighth report. We are monitoring progress on Empower policy packages, which is basically key demand reduction measures, which have been agreed by uh, countries as part of the Framework Convention under Tobacco Control, FCTC, the only WHO treaty. So these measures include raising taxes, putting pictorial health warnings, banning advertising sponsorship, smoke-free environment, helping smokers to quit. So we measure progress for all 194 countries. And what we are seeing in this report is that there is global progress. Despite the pandemic, countries are moving forward their policies. For example, between 2019 and this year, we've got 24 more countries to adopt some of these policies at the highest level, which is quite encouraging. Tobacco taxation as uh, one of the policies which is not moved forward and it's been difficult for countries to raise taxes because the industry has been resisted but pictorial health warning for example now we have 101 countries pictorial warnings um, as per the best recommended practice so we are seeing good progress but this report then focuses on new and emerging products what we are seeing is that the countries are not fully regulating these products And the tobacco industry has used that opportunity to expand the market of electronic nicotine delivery devices, which are commonly known as e-cigarettes. And it has created a situation. We have 84 countries that have done nothing. We have 32 countries that have banned these products. And then in the middle, we have 79 countries that have some form of regulation. Uh, Only nine of these countries ban flavors. Use of flavors leads to children getting attracted to these products and that results in e-cigarettes being used by children, which in sense means that we are creating a new generation of addicts. And then what we are seeing from the results is that the, these children are two to three times more likely to become tobacco smokers when they grow up. This has been well documented and this report brings it out very clearly. Jason, in your role mm -hmm. representing uh, Young Voices as the UK lead and programme manager, are you seeing that reflected with the young people you work with? No, not at all. This is, I think, the same tactic that was used recently to push through the junk food advertising ban, isn't it? It's using children to political ends and using children's voices and making out as if um, there's some grand victimisation going on. I think if you spoke to someone who works for a vaping company, they would be very clear that they are not targeting children. They've got no interest in targeting children as customers. And if what you're trying to do is to wean people off of cigarettes, to make smoking become a thing of the past and to reduce the harm that is caused by smoking, then vaping is the solution to that. It's not a problem. Uh, It doesn't contribute to that. If we take Britain as an example, more than half of Britain's vapors, e-cigarette users, are former smokers. That's 1.7 million people. And vaping is infinitely uh, safer than smoking. The uh, Action on Smoking and Health group estimates that it has roughly 0.5% of the risk of cancer that smoking does. Um, And so I think it's very clear that the World Health Organization is not doing this out of the goodness of its heart. It's doing this because it wants to take more control. It wants more power over our lifestyles. The World Health Organization, instead of focusing on communicable diseases, on preparing for future pandemics, which is what it should be doing, it's starting to interfere in all kinds of other areas. The way things are going, if we, if the World Health Organization gets what it wants, before long we're all going to be living very miserable lives, eating grey sludge, and there'll be a thousand new rules about what you can and can't do in public, or you can't eat that, you can't drink that, you can't smoke that. Fundamentally, it's an issue of freedom. People are not uh, vulnerable and helpless and just uh, addicted to all sorts of products and waiting for the benevolent hand of the state to reach down and save them from their plight. We are we are adults. We don't need to be patronised and infantilised in this kind of way. We can make our own choices without the WHO's help. Okay, Dr. Prasad, your, your thoughts on that? Are you uh, making us all, uh, well, 
thinking of us all as children when you release reports like this? So there are a couple of things, and we are confusing apples and oranges. Number one, that there is nothing called harm reduction. The industry has come out with this terminology and is pushing their narrative. And this narrative is clearly designed at creating a new cohort of addicts who will then be forced to stay addicts. Number two, switching is not quitting. What I'm talking, so be, this is not my personal view. We have documented practices of 194 countries. What we are seeing in this report is that 70% of tobacco users who are switching to e-cigarettes are continuing to use tobacco, which essentially means because of lax conditions and requirements of being allowed to smoke or vape in a public place, they use e-cigarettes and then they go to tobacco. This is totally documented, 70% dual use, which is more harmful. And then UK is, of course, in a social experiment and it's the only country in the world at this point of time which has introduced e-cigarettes as a quid device. We've not seen this evidence. We've not seen it. Uh, this is a practice in other countries. In Australia, it's just been introduced under medical prescription. The rest of the countries, now I just mentioned 32 countries have banned it. Half of them, nearly half of them are upper middle income countries and high income countries. So we need to look at the global picture. We need to look at the global trends and we need to respect government's decisions which they are made. And we, as WHO, respect all government's decisions, including the one by the UK, on promoting the product as a cessation aid because we are watching and seeing the evidence. So we'll continue to watch and see the evidence which is coming from UK, which is coming from other countries. And hopefully, over a period of time, we will get to know uh, on where things stand with respect to the harms related to e-cigarettes. Jason, we're seeing measures to uh, restrict things like the sale of petrol cars by 2030. Why should tobacco be any different? Well, petrol cars pollute the environment, don't they? Whereas smoking is, is a lifestyle choice and vaping even more so because there isn't any danger to other people. There isn't any danger of uh, secondhand smoke, um, which you have with cigarettes. I want to pick up on a, on a couple of things you said. First of all, that there's no such thing as harm reduction. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'll quote the, the figure I used before. The lifetime cancer risk of vaping is less than 0.5% of the risk of smoking. If that's not harm reduction, then I don't know what is. Um, and as I say, we've also uh, eliminated the risk associated with secondhand smoking because there's no health risk associated with secondhand e-cigarette vapor. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever that e-cigarettes uh, leads to an increase of smoking in young people, at least in Britain. There's no evidence of that. You said that there isn't evidence of vaping helping people quit. I disagree completely. There is plenty of evidence of that. Vaping is by far the most effective cessation method in all the scientific trials that have been conducted. 74% of uh, smokers who tried to quit using vaping were successful in doing that. Much more successful than nicotine patches, much more successful than any other method of cessation. But fundamentally, even if vaping was harmful, which it isn't, uh, this would come down to the same fundamental point, which is about control, about politics. The WHO is unaccountable. I'm sure it's staffed by very intelligent and hardworking people, but they're not elected by anyone. They're not accountable to anyone. If Boris Johnson's government does something I don't like on public health, I have the opportunity to vote them out in a few years' time. Who do I complain to at the WHO when I don't like the fact that it's restricting my freedom? And Dr. Prasad, just come back on that. I'm just reading out the facts from the report. What I have narrated is what's coming in the report. The facts are very clear. Tobacco is killing 8 million people every year and a million from secondhand smoke. The harms of e-cigarettes are not known. E-cigarettes are harmful because they lead to cardiovascular toxicity, they lead to cancers, they lead to other risks. There is a whole range of debate going around it. We are looking at the evidence. We are an evidence-based organization. We look at the evidence. We lay the evidence before the member states, all 194, and they look at it very carefully, including the government of UK. So we, we are accountable to the member states, which we are continuing to stay accountable, and we will do so.
Can I just ask whether you feel, Dr. Prasad, that there's a sense that we might be pushing a bit of a confusing message for smokers here, that in the UK, as you mentioned, uh, there's very much a sense that e-cigarettes are a way to uh, a journey towards quitting smoking. And by saying that actually we should make them even more difficult to access, uh, perhaps that's pushing people to smoke, well, normal cigarettes. As I said earlier, UK social experiment, we respect the government's decision to move on and to regulate the way they want to introduce the electronic cigarette in the market and to let the smokers. We are waiting for the results and we are looking at the results very carefully. We are also looking at the results from the remaining countries who have taken certain regulatory actions. WHO's recommendation apply to all countries but it is for the governments to take their own decision. They are sovereign. We only give the evidence and we will go by the evidence in terms of what we see, not by rhetoric, not by what the tobacco industry has been parroting uh, about these products, because they are the ones who created the problem. They're not the solution provider. So we don't work with in that manner. Mm. Jason, just a final thought from you. Surely the aim should be a smoke-free world, however we get there. Uh, not necessarily. I think people should be, as I said, free to choose what they want to do, even if that is harmful to them, which we know that smoking is. We can do all sorts of things to restrict harm from all kinds of products. If we wanted, we could ban cars altogether and we would eliminate uh, deaths from traffic accidents. But we don't do that, of course, because there is a balance to be found between protecting people and keeping them safe and healthy and allowing them to live their lives in the way that they want to. The WHO says that it you know, you say that you respect um, the British government and any other government for making the decision that it wants to make on regulating these kinds of products, but that's not true, is it? I mean, I'm reading from the press release that accompanied this report. It boasts about how many people are now covered by World Health Organization recommended tobacco control measures. This is just about taking more and more control of people's lives. Freedom is not a social experiment. Allowing people to vape if they want to, to smoke if they want to. That's not a social experiment. That's the norm. That's the default. And you are actively trying to change the norm and curb people's freedoms. And you don't have any right to do that.